God, we know that all good things come from you. You created the gifts we cherish, including the gift of time. We want to be generous with this gift, as you have been generous with us. But God, why is there never enough? We're pretty worried that we won't have time to get everything done. We're not sure how we could possibly do one more thing. Teach us to relax, God. Grow our faith. You give us gifts knowing we will learn to share them with others. We belong to you. We belong to others. Help us to love you and others as ourselves in this moment and for all time yet to come. Amen. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. Instead of doing those things, these persons love the Lord's instruction, and they recite God's instruction day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time, and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. That's not true for the wicked. They are like dust that the wind blows away, and that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice, neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is destroyed. What time is it? Well, it's time to be good stewards of God's good gift of time, which is to say, to be good stewards of life itself. Time is that basic and foundational to life itself. When we started last week, we talked about how we sometimes think managing our time better is somehow the key to success. And since we all generally feel like we're always short on time, we always feel like we've somehow let ourselves down at the very least, if not everyone else. We've considered the wisdom of the scriptures. We sang about time. I'm sure you noticed some of the time references in the music. We've added in some spiritual reflection from Jen Pollock Michael's book, In Good Time, and a little from Cal Newport's bestseller, Slow Productivity. By the way, both of those books are very interesting and worth the time <laughs> to read if you're looking for something and can fit it in your schedule. Jen Michael's book asks us to intentionally cultivate some attitudes and habits about time and how we use it. To begin and to receive were last week. This week, it will be to belong and to offer. These are habits to grow and strengthen our faith. I will say that both books are pretty down on the whole idea of time management and the industry of productivity that actually makes people feel more stressed and less in charge of their time. In Good Time makes the case that the whole premise of time management is control and the elimination of contingency and uh, just self-reliance, none of which are really Christian spiritual values. In fact, they are the opposite when taken to extremes. To belong. As people of faith, it is central to our life. We belong to God, we belong to each other in community, and we belong together in the dirt. As our scripture for the day says, the righteous are like a tree planted by streams of water which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. Are they just using their time better than the rest of the world? No, they are growing in faith and community. We spent some time among the trees this last week. Have you ever explored Silver Mountain out by the Sturgeon River Gorge. It's just a gorgeous, pun intended, view of treetops from up there. It's actually a much nicer view than Mount Arvin, the official highest point, which is not too far away from there. The beauty of nature reminds us 
of God's good gifts, and the trees are a direct link to the habit of belonging and how that relates to time. Jen's book gives us the example of redwoods and the difference between American and European redwoods. We can conjure up images of majestic giant redwoods, the sequoias of Northern California. The ones here in this country and the ones overseas are the same tree, only they don't grow over there like they do here. It's not because the United States is a better country than the UK or Germany, soil-wise. It's because of belonging. In the late 1800s, giant sequoias were taken as prizes to Europe. They were grown in palace gardens and nurseries, and they grew all alone, without other trees, without their tree families. Seriously. They were raised without parent trees, aunts, uncles, cousin trees, and raised in nurseries, their root balls ended up severely trimmed, which would make them easier to move, but they never recover from that root damage. They don't develop that crucial network of roots and fungi that allow them to share resources with each other. Trees do best together, it seems. They exchange news about insects, drought, and other dangers, according to Peter Volleben in his book, The Hidden Life of Trees. They share nutrients. They grow together in ways that benefit each other, so there aren't gaps in the canopy which leave the trees vulnerable to storms. They're sheltered by being together in community, and it is the best kind of productivity for long-term healthy life. The beginning of the Psalms gives us this wisdom too. Psalm 1 offers a vision of canopies and roots, a lush green picture of health. The tree in Psalm 1 is a tree planted by God, and whatever it does is successful. Productivity in this Psalm, though, has little to do with the clock and accomplishments, and everything to do with family and relationships. When trees grow together, they create an ecosystem that moderates extreme temperatures, stores water, and controls humidity. In this protected environment, trees can live to be very old, it says in good time. The growing together seems to be the key, and a reminder that together, everyone belongs to the kingdom of God, at least the garden of God, and anyone can be a part of that. Psalm 1 says, it says if you're a truly happy person who doesn't follow wicked advice, who doesn't stand on the road of sinners and doesn't sit with the disrespectful, someone who instead of doing those things, loves the Lord in instruction, that's how you are a member of this family. So, that's a fair amount about belonging. Let's shift to offering. Not offering as in the thing we do not long before the service is over, but offering ourselves in community to fulfill our role in this wider body of Christ. Offering in the sense of what we give back, how we respond to God's grace and invitation to abundant life in this beloved community. Our usefulness and productivity and conquering of the clock aren't the best we can do and best we can offer. Worship is. Faithfully speaking, what counts in life isn't productivity or influence or impact or any other pseudo-productive buzzword. What counts is knowing that time belongs not to us, but to God. What counts is the act of offering ourselves over and over again and again. What counts is offering us, ourselves, our time, our life. It's not necessarily a big production or any kind of ritual. It's just saying, here I am, God, here I am, and leaving the rest up to God to direct. How many of the great figures of the Bible started their life with God? in just that way, 
Abraham, about to make a tragic decision, pauses in response to God calling to him, Genesis 22, and says, here I am. And then Jacob, in one of his crazy dreams, says to God, here I am, in Genesis 31. Moses in the desert, watching the bush, or maybe it was more like a tree, that never burned up but stayed on fire, knowing it was God, well, knowing it was God because God was talking to him, said, like the others, here I am in Exodus 3. And Samuel, as a young boy alone in the shrine of the holy place at night, hears a voice and says back, here I am. Isaiah in the temple, Mary in her mother's kitchen in the middle of the week. <laughs> Actually, we don't know where, but we know that Mary said it too, although she changes the script slightly, but offers herself nonetheless. What counts, it seems so clearly by those examples, is our faithful response to God's invitation. And then what happens after we say, here I am? What do we say or do next? Nothing. Well, not nothing. Not actually. But nothing productive. Nothing that has to be efficient or effective. The next thing we offer ourselves to is most naturally to rest. In other words, to worship, to observe some kind of Sabbath. Jesus advises us to consider some things in this life, not first and foremost our eternal destination, but more immediate things, more tangible things. He says, consider the birds, consider the lilies. And yes, birds are interesting and flowers are pretty, but in addition to those creatures not being anxious about things, which is what he was getting at, and I think that's also kind of relevant to our conversation today, he is inviting us to shift away from thinking that we have to accomplish and to do it quickly and have to do it better than before or more than the other guy. He is inviting us, once we've said we're ready for what's next, by offering ourselves to just be, to rest. And do we realize what a gift that is? Thinking about the beginning of the story of God and people, after all the busyness of making something, everything, out of nothing in Genesis, God turned his people loose into the luxurious hours of the Sabbath. And God himself rested. The first and foremost important thing wasn't to do more, to make a difference in this world. It was to rest. The Sabbath is a day to remember that whatever we do, whatever our life is all about, whatever we offer ourselves up to, giving our time and energy to it, it will not keep the world spinning. That's God's job. Rest is a gift offered to us by God before we ever attempt to offer anything back to God. It's a weekly rhythmic reminder of God's love for us that's built in to time itself. Of course, it's a natural inclination of ours to want to prove our usefulness, to demonstrate our devotion, to make God proud of us. But that wouldn't be devotion or worship. It would put us at the center of everything, as if our worth, our usefulness, our demonstration of power, majesty, and accomplishment were the most important thing in the universe. But God isn't asking us to make progress. And we're not always supposed to be moving forward and getting ahead and maximizing our efficiency. We're asked to worship. God doesn't ask us to do anything in worship. It's just a chance for us to offer ourselves to God's purposes. It's not signing up for an enlistment in God's army. Worship is not an achievement. It's not a goal. It's our purpose. It is just to be, to belong, and to be. Worship is actually a very inefficient thing. Faithful people aren't called to be superheroes or geniuses, just people who find themselves with their brothers and sisters and aunts, uncles, cousins, and so on, and find themselves with God. Like life itself, like time itself. It is a gift 
that God offers to us. Here I am, we offer back. Here we are, knowing we belong. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. To learn more about everything that's happening in and around Marquette Hope, check out our Facebook page. You can also get our newsletter on the Facebook as well. Pod Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on 